Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's Digital Making at Home live stream. It's great to have you back. Uh, if you haven't already, say hi in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm Mr. C, coming to you live once again from Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And with me, as always, is the dynamic Christina. How's it going, Christina? Hello. I always love the adjectives you have for me every week. It's really <laughs> fun. And hello to everyone. It's so great to see you all again. I'm joining from my home in Nebraska in the USA. And thank you to everyone who's joining us from your homes all over the world. Today is gonna to be a really fun show. This week we're talking to Eleanor, who wants to be the first person to set foot on Mars. What an incredible goal. And lots of people in the chat already. I see Nathaniel on YouTube. Thanks for joining us again, Nathaniel. I remember you were with us last week. Welcome back. Yeah, um, and then Ornan on Facebook. Hello, so great to see you all. It's really exciting. How are you doing today, Mr. C? I'm really good, thank you. I'm actually quite well. I had a really nice like um, day today. We got a bit of homeschooling done with the boys. We crushed some maths this afternoon, which was really good. So like feeling pumped and stuff for that. And how are you? It's your birthday soon, right? It is. Tomorrow's my birthday. Yeah. Yes. So, oh, hello, Gobal. And I see Noga56 joining us from Argentina on Twitch. And um, Celio on Facebook. Ali. Hi, Ali. <laughs> yes. Thank you for coming back. But yes, my birthday is actually tomorrow. So if you all have any suggestions for what you've done to bring birthday magic <laughs> to your lives in the past year, I'm sure we've, we're going through the cycle, right? So <laughs> like, what, what have y'all done? I'm, I'm thinking some virtual board games maybe nice. i know maybe among us anyone yeah, been yeah, playing yeah. Any among us lately that's loads of fun i quite like that that's a really good game to play you'll jump on a discord server and have a chat and like sort of you know murder each other on a spaceship it's great <laughs> high recommendation that's really good i always like being a crew member i'm like let's get the spaceship moving but there's yeah. A, yeah a secret like oh wait i have to i'm the i already forgot the word what is it when you're the bad the guy imposter. You're the imposter, the imposter. yes yeah, such a yeah. good yeah the, the imposter exactly. there are so many folks go ball saying happy birthday thanks <laughs> appreciate it thank you ali appreciate it so much but yeah curious mr c i feel like you always come in with some cool tech knowledge anything that you've learned or seen this past week that you can share with the group What's cool this week? Uh, oh, autonomous trucks are rolling out across the US for the first time this week. That's something that's really, really cool. Um, considering that up until now, we haven't been able to do this. When you think about like having a truck and how big it is and how fast they move, yeah. and how much control you need, right? Like we haven't been able to do that with the tech, but it's just jumped up now so that we can actually make a big further spread of range that we're searching for. And the truck has way more control. Oh, so wow. Wow, that's really interesting, right? To, to think that, I, I mean, Let's talk about like, what do you know about sort of like the technology that is being used to make sure that truck is just driving straight, right? Sure. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they use this thing called LiDAR. And so we had, uh, it could scan in all directions of things and detect where things are. And they have a computer that does calculations. So up until now, we haven't really had to get further than 200 meters with LiDAR. But we've just had a breakthrough and they started putting it in tech now that can go up to a thousand meters ahead with HD cameras. So that's wow. a whole kilometer for those of us that use kilometers um, to, to travel in. And so that means that you can do a lot more things. So you can have a lot more control. It can calculate things that are further away and how dangerous they might be, how fast they're going, what direction they're traveling. And then the truck can make all these calculations in real time and sort of slow down, speed up and avoid obstacles. Wow, that's that's incredible, right? When you think just like the potential there and what like we can do, and just also what that can be done for folks that like still want to drive. Like, how can that technology be used on in cars? Because I know like I have friends now. I don't. <laughs> like, I have friends now who've gotten cars that just have, or I've rented one, right? When like you're driving and it like alerts you if someone's on the left or someone's on the right. So Absolutely. thinking the scale of that for a truck is just it's pretty incredible it's to see where we are now. Yeah. yeah, and they move a lot faster. There's so much more weight. Like they have to be able to slow down a lot further ahead than our cars do so being able to do that now it makes a big deal and like for those of you guys who are worried there's actually someone who sits in an office so like i'm sitting at my desk now and they have a whole bunch of monitors in front of them and they're watching all the trucks as they drive and so if one of them starts to send up a warning or it can't work something out that person can take control with a remote control truck handle here like a steering wheel and continue driving the truck like manually which is super cool Wow. You know, that makes me think a lot about what we talk about here pretty regularly at Digital Making at Home, just the idea of technology and helping kids think about jobs that don't even exist yet, right? Absolutely. Like Absolutely. how just becoming familiar with technology and code. It's not about like, what do you want to be when you grow up? But like, what do you want to learn so you can do what's going to exist, right? Because these jobs, I mean, when you and I were 
younger <laughs> in <laughs> elementary school, middle school. These jobs, like Raspberry Pi didn't even exist. Yeah, yeah, which the is pretty things incredible. we today didn't exist when we were learning, right? So, and that's why having those broad set of skills is really important. The idea that you can understand how machines think and how they work and be able to code them and do science with them or upskill your life and all those sorts of things. And that's that's pretty much what we're all about here. It's about getting young people like you guys coding, creating, making with tech, making yourself more powerful digital citizens. That's really important. And so every week we chat with awesome people. We code together and we make all sorts of cool digital making projects. So we're broadcasting now this week, guys, to YouTube, to Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. I always try and remember all of them. Uh, and we'll be able to see your comments and we do want to hear from you. So pop them in the chat if you've got something to say. So should we bring Eleanor on now and have a chat with her? Yes, come on in, Eleanor. Great. Hi. Hey, Hello. How are you doing today, Eleanor? I uh, love love the outfit right now, like the hairband. Like, oh, that was so much fun. Awesome. It's what I call my STEM spirit. <laughs> yes, yes, the STEM spirit. So we can see the boat. Is there anything else? I see like a full. Yes, like, I even suit. have a little tutu on. Amazing, and it lights up too. Oh, okay. That's our first yes. tutu, socks, which I know are hard to see, but they're there. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. If you have a tutu at home, put it on. Today's a tutu wearing day, right? For Let's sure. talk about space. Let's talk about your goal to be on Mars. And yes, bring on the tutus. I love that. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, could you just give yourself a bit of an intro for the people watching at home, Eleanor, and let us know sort of who you are, where you're from, and how much you love space? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Eleanor. I live in Woodbridge, Virginia, and I'm the middle of five kids. So I have two older sisters and two little brothers. And I would describe our house as a maker house. We have two gigantic bits and bobs bins, and we've always been encouraged to just kind of go grab whatever we want for them and kind of make anything. And I always grew up coming home to my older sisters, having their friends over, and they'd be just making random things. And I'll never forget the time one of my friends, one of my um, sister's friends came over, and they said, do you have surprise supplies to make a giant hammer? And just the most randomest things that happen in my house. It's always a lot of fun. I can't tell you the number of car engines I've had to repair. And I actually think um, I got my start in electrical engineering and really loving it by having to repair our stove. I had to take apart the back with my dad and actually resolder a bunch of the joints because they just hadn't been working. And just being able to have a problem and then do something and fix it and see it working at the end was absolutely inspiring. But as for my interest in space specifically, um, we always used to snuggle on our back deck and watch the stars and just, it kind of grew into obsession from there. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Do you have a favorite constellation? Yes, I love Cassiopeia. That was the first one I learned. And I just, I find it so amazing because I was taught that it was her crown, but I actually later learned that it was like her throne that she sits on, but I just, I love it. <laughs> Yes. Oh, okay. So fun fact, Eleanor, I talk about Cassiopeia a lot on this live stream yeah. because it's actually the name of my puppy. So I named her Cassiopeia and she goes by Cassie for short, but that's, yeah, that's my favorite constellation. I love that story. I think it's just, and it's just, yeah, the idea that like you think it's a crown, but it's a throne, let alone upside down. There's just so many levels there. And it's something I, I can see from my backyard every night, which is really fun. Exactly. I like that. It's something I can always identify in the sky, no matter where I am. It's just, I love it. <laughs> That's so cool. And especially the part, talk, like, I didn't realize you're the middle of five siblings. And to like be in a house for making it, that's, that's really neat. It made me think about like, I remember my brother's CD player broke and my dad had to be like, okay, well, let's take it apart. And to be in a space where like, instead of just tossing it, it's like, let's, how can we fix it? And if we can't fix it, how can we just learn what's inside? That's, that's incredible. I love that that's like been a part of your experience growing up. That's really neat. For sure. We've always been encouraged to just do whatever we want to do. And as long as we're going to do it, just put our best foot forward, put our put effort into it, because honestly, you never know what you're going to learn and you never know what you're going to like, most importantly. So it's always just a learning opportunity. For sure. I love that statement about putting your best foot forward. And so, I mean, your goal is to set foot, like be the first person on Mars, right? Like that is right. amazing. Like I love that idea. That's so huge. How did you land on that as a personal goal? Something so oh my goodness. <laughs> Honestly, I've been asked this question before and I can never quite pinpoint an answer because it's always kind of changing. It's not really a question of why or how, and it's just that it is. It's just kind of a thing. I Space is a community and it's a place, it's an industry, honestly, where all careers are needed. So I could be whatever I wanted. I could like work with textiles and design the suits for the astronauts, or I could be electrical and programming. And you could have the business side of it, of like the human interfacing. It's just absolutely amazing and not to mention the fact that weightlessness is awesome it's really cool and just seeing it's no place no no one's gone before well people have gone there but it's new and it's inspiring and 
I don't know. It just kind of happened. <laughs> I love it. The word, I think the word I'd like to use for it is pioneering. I think that's yes. the spirit that you're after, like the idea of getting out there and extending the boundaries of human understanding and human knowledge. And like, that's so admirable. I think that's amazing. Intergalactic wanderlust, as I like to call awesome. it. <laughs> yeah, that is excellent. I love that term. I got it. That's so good. I mean, so you, you were saying it's awesome in zero G. Um, what did you do in zero gravity? Have you been up in zero G? Yes, yeah, tell us a little um, bit more about that. <laughs> Um, I actually, um, like I grew up in a maker house, we also grew up in a house, I grew up in a house with a lot of experimentation. So it's um, find a question and kind of experiment with it and try and find a solution to it. So recently I um, started looking at slosh, which is the unwanted movement of fluid in the tank. So if you were to shake up your water bottle, the water moving inside that slosh. And it's plagued NASA since the 1950s and it causes spacecraft to um, move around uncontrollably or jitter. And that jittering is just not good at all. And furthermore, slosh can cause air bubbles to get into the fuel, which can cause misfires. And so this has been a challenge that's been along for a while and I wanted to solve it and I wanted to try and find a solution to that problem. But um, because it's slosh in microgravity and microgravity is where there's a lack of gravity or very minimal gravity, it became kind of um, difficult to experiment with it. So I actually had to figure out how to get a ride on a zero, gene, uh, zero G parabolic plane. So it flies in arcs that create microgravity. And so I got to go and test my experiment while also getting to be in microgravity, which is a win-win for everything. And it was just, it was awesome. That's so cool. So oh, we've got a video, video, video on it. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, <laughs> basically uh, what you're looking at is water that has been dyed with food coloring inside of um, just plastic tanks. And basically in microgravity, since there's a lack of gravity, the strongest um, forces or the push and the pull on the fluid in microgravity is the attraction between the tank and the fluid itself. And so basically I was trying to see, can I use that attraction to control the fluid slosh? So my tanks are coated with um, a super hydrophilic, which means it really, really likes water, and super hydrophobic, which means it really dislikes water coatings. And so they're, the coatings are placed specifically to try and control the location of the water. So I basically, that's my test apparatus. It's made of aluminum bar stock and a bunch of Raspberry Pi parts. There are 13 Raspberry Pi total, <laughs> um, one that controls 12 other Pis, and then those 12 other Pis actually have Pi cameras that are collecting the data and recording the spheres so I can analyze it after the flight. So it was a lot of programming, a lot of wiring, and then mainly a lot of wire management to make sure that everything was out of the yeah. way. So, I was going to um, say, your cable management is on point, by the way. It's really good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I yeah. owe that mainly to my robotics team because I'm the electrical captain there, and that has been some of the weirdest wired management I've ever had to do. So it helps a lot for this. but. Yeah. Um, very yeah, cool. was, you, uh, we can see you floating around and stuff in the vomit comet, which is um, <laughs> that's what we used to refer to it when I was a kid. Um, so uh, you can see you going zero G, your hair like floating around and stuff there. Like that is the most bizarre feeling, isn't it? Like being weightless like that. It was absolutely amazing. It, I was really nervous that I was going to get air sick, but luckily it did not. I was safe the entire flight <laughs> and I made it back down mm -hmm. and it just kind of further solidified that this is what I want to do. Um, people kind of, um, well, most of the time people um, compare being in zero G to swimming, but I can tell you it's nothing like that because you try and kick and move around so that you can control yourself. And instead you just end up kicking people and it's yeah. not good. <laughs> there's, there's nothing to pull against, right? You just end up doing cartoon swimming going nowhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I learned that the hard way for sure. Wow. Yeah, Mr. C, have you been in your zero G before? Yeah, so growing up when I was an Air Force cadet, um, they used to take us to the Air Force base in the summer. We used to do camps and I'd stay there for like two weeks at a time or however long, get promoted as a cadet. And so we'd go and train with the Air Force guys and they'd take us up in the Vomit Comet and we'd all strap in and we'd go up and down and do those parabolas like you say. So when you're seeing them floating around everybody, what's happening is the plane actually goes up in a big curve and at about this point at the peak of the curve is when you start feeling yourself lift. Like you might have felt a tiny bit on a roller coaster or if your car goes over a bump on the highway and you sort of feel that whoa feeling like for an instant. Imagine that doesn't stop for like about 30 seconds straight and you're constantly just feeling that go like you're literally floating as the plane is dropping. What's actually happening is you're falling out of the sky in a really controlled way. So you're not flying, you're falling in style, right? And then when it comes up, they come to the bottom of the parabola and you feel the G's pull you back down and you get extra heavy, right? 
and a squish and then you go back up and do the whole thing again over it's really fun and loads of people puke yep which is why they call it the vomit comet awesome Oh, yes, wow, look, yeah, oh, that's so, so neat. That's me outside the plane. So basically that giant hatch, they force lifted my experiment up in there and then they bolted it into the ground. And it this is definitely the most in-depth experiment I've ha ever had to do because I had to learn about loads and make sure that it wasn't going to pull out of the ground during like the G's and stuff. And it was definitely very weird because some of the electronics didn't work in microgravity the way they worked mm -hmm. on Earth, which is definitely going to be a learning process. And I haven't quite pinpointed it yet, but I'm doing a lot of research on it so yeah thanks for admitting that right like if you were just look at that video you'd be like wow cool she got to go zero g it was probably amazing she, and like but it's just admitting that you know guys some stuff didn't work and that's why we oh, do yeah. these experiments right you want it to work eventually <laughs> so when yeah. it goes up in space you've got it solid oh oh what's this tell us about this photo so this is an up close of um, my test apparatus. So you can see the Pi camera is in the back there between um, two Raspberry Pis. And then on the front side, there are the spheres. So basically that Pi has been mounted such that the angle, it can watch both of those tanks at the same time. So at the end, I then take out the SD card, load it onto my computer, and then I click through frame by frame <laughs> to find when the um, fluid starts moving and when it stops moving. And that gives me the time it takes for the, um, the settling time, as I call it, basically just the time it takes for the fluid to stop moving. And basically I have to do that for every single camera. And then you have the pies mounted there and they're connected to the pie cameras. I also have accelerometers on here and load cells to collect the forces that the fluid is putting onto um, the rest of the tank. Wow. And so there's my accelerometer. One is to detect um, zero G so when I enter zero G and the other ones to detect the acceleration, I'm actually imposing onto the apparatus. If you saw my previous videos, I have this wooden stick, which I call the push rod, but it's honestly just a fancy broom handle. <laughs> nice. And I bolt it onto there. So because it has to go through my double containment tank, because I also had water leakage just a little bit, but um, basically you don't want that floating around and getting on other people's experiments. So I had little puppy piddle pads in the bottom to collect the water when we went back to um, 2G and normal gravity. So yeah. That's wow. Okay. I'm curious for you, which came first? Cause I'm always, how did people like learn about Raspberry Pis? So like, was this experiment? And then you were like, okay, I need to find a tool. Oh, the Raspberry Pi can work. Or did you know about Raspberry Pis and it became a tool that you used with this experiment when you decided to do it? I definitely knew of Raspberry Pi beforehand. Um, I'd actually started because of Vex Robotics in middle school. Oh. I really started loving programming and engineering. And from there, my mom actually signed me up for a summer class where I was introduced to Raspberry Pi. And then from there, I started using it just kind of in everyday life and to just kind of make little things and tinker when I was bored. And then it became a solution to some of my experimentation. So. Oh, wow. Super neat. That's awesome. Yeah. And like the construction of the actual apparatus itself, that must have taken like a long time to do. Like it's quite a complex bit of kit that you've designed and built there. Like was that a long process, like of iteration and changing bits and making sure everything was perfect? Or did you do a bunch of planning first? I did a bunch of planning. I actually used CAD, computer aided design. And so I constructed the entire test apparatus on my computer and I made sure everything would fit because um, you have to pay for the size of your payload. So I really had to be careful of balancing getting as much on the plane as humanly possible, but also keeping cost flow because I am a high school student and I only have so many funds. Um, but I catted the entire test apparatus using Autodesk Inventor, and then I purchased um, 8020 bar stock, and then I cut it up in my basement and put it together in my living room. <laughs> cut it up with a hacksaw or um, a yeah, bandsaw? Yeah. Bandsaw, nice. So you got a proper workshop in your house, like with power tools and the works. Um, more or less, <laughs> it, the shelving might be falling off the walls, but we have the tool. <laughs> doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You just push the pile to the side and get off the tool that you need right now, right? Yeah, like exactly. that's a proper, that's a living workshop. That one. That's, that's awesome. And you were saying like, you had a limited amount of funds. How did you fund it? Because like going up in the zero G plane has got to be real pricey, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it was about twenty five thousand dollars. So I raised funds through grants. Um, uh, GoFundMe, and I had an internship that I used over the summer. So anything I couldn't get through grants and the very generous donations from GoFundMe, I kind of patched with my internship um, savings. So amazing! Yeah. That's super cool. Wow, that's Thank that's you. really neat to hear. Yeah, I I just appreciate you know it's like some you see folks your hair's floating. It's like oh my gosh, but hearing about just like 
the work behind it, right? It's so important to talk about that. And we actually have a question, if you could talk a little more about the experiment from Ali, like how could you track the error in this amazing, he calls it your amazing magic box. <laughs> so you mentioned like you identified the errors and like maybe talk about just a little bit of the data analysis after you were back on earth. Sure, so the surprisingly, there wasn't much error in the data. I huh. learned a very important part of experimentation, such as having a backup data collection system. Mm -hmm. So I actually, luckily I purchased um, GoPros before the flight, and I expected to mainly use them just as kind of a recording device of the moment, you know, like recording me floating around right. and just like the experience. But I ended up having two assistants actually, um, you saw during videos, they actually kind of hovered on the side and mm -hmm. they held the GoPros so they could get the outside of the tank. And that data ended up being extremely important because wow. sometimes um, some of the pies, um, the pie cameras would glitch and I would be missing video data mm -hmm. and I'd be able to patch that data with the GoPros. Mm -hmm. But it was mainly just a lot of sitting and clicking and going through um, frame by frame by frame. And then I would count the frames and, um, just calculate things like settling time. And from a more um, qualitative standpoint, I would look at where the fluid settled and that would give me like, cause in micro, as you saw, some of them were like on the side of the tank and there were bubbles in mm -hmm. the middle. And so making sure they aggregated all at the bottom of the tank was extremely important. Wow. I hope Super that answers cool. the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 that's a great answer. That's really good. <laughs> Very cool. And so you must have been doing science for a long time, right? So like the way that you talk about science, you are obviously very knowledgeable about doing experimental science and those sorts of things. Like, where did it all start for you? Sort of like, was it science fairs at school or? Yes, actually. Um, my fourth grade science fair project, um, I'd kind of, because I have my older sisters, I always got to watch them growing up and see the awesome things they were doing. I'm like, can I please do this? This is like something I've always been dying to do. So fourth grade, I got to do a science fair project and I play the violin. And I wanted to see if there was a um, correlation between the size of the violin and the tone quality. So my experiment's name was Does Size Matter? <laughs> and um, I ended up finding out that yes, the size does affect the tone quality to an extent and then price does play into it a lot. Um, so that was kind of what jump started it. And then in middle school, I realized my goal is to go to space. I wanna do things that are real world that are gonna help out the industry and really get to fuel my chances of going there. And I worked with coal gas rocket nozzles um, to find the optimum uh, geometry of the nozzle to produce the most thrust for the smallest lightest nozzle. And then from there I got into slosh. And so it's kind of just been a snowball effect of really honestly loving to learn and just kind of being very, very grateful for the opportunities that I've been given because it's just been awesome. <laughs> That's cool. That's super neat. I'm curious, are, do you have any other siblings who are interested in space or like interested in joining you in Mars or not, right? I'm always, I have a brother, so it's sometimes we have very right. similar interests and sometimes no. <laughs> I couldn't be in a spaceship with my brother. <laughs> we're not, we're not. <laughs> So um, we all kind of do our own little things. Um, my older sister, Della, um, she's a graphic designer as well as works in business. Um, my, older, my second older sister, Piper, she actually is more into the aerospace and she does want to go to Mars with me. Um, <laughs> she's more into the material side of things. And then there's me who's really programming and electrical. Um, my little brother, Max, who either wants to be a chef or an engineer. And then Sam, who wants to be a lawyer. So but there's kind of a wide spread of us, <laughs> but we all kind of... Um, surprisingly we got along fairly well <laughs> that's cool you have to though right like if you're going to mars like that's it's a long way to get there and then once you get there you're the only people on that planet like what do you think what what's your aim when you go to mars what do you think it's going to be like what do you want to do with your time there and all that sort of stuff oh goodness i haven't thought ahead that far just getting there first that's the first step <laughs> um but I guess, honestly, just do more experimentation, collect samples, collect data, like things that robots can't do because we have sent rovers and things, but never people. So really just being able to get a human standpoint on assessing the situation and maybe there is life, like bacteria and things. I mean, bacteria is life and that would just be fascinating to find and eventually colonizing it because I truly do believe that um, humans as a society will end up a multiplanetary species. Yeah, we almost have to, right? It's oh, for sure. Now where we got to get out of here, like we got to find other places to colonize <laughs> and spread out. There's not, not enough space in bed anymore. No, yeah. man. 
Yeah. And I'm just seeing folks saying hi and just like just being so impressed <laughs> by like what you're what you're talking about. Like incredible you got some Spanish, felicidades, <laughs> increíble. Oh. Like super cool folks from all over the world just celebrating the work that you're doing, which is really neat. If you have a question for Elna, please like feel free to put it in the chat. We'd love um we'd love to try and answer that for you. I'm curious, Eleanor, like you're talking about Mars. Do you have like something I I don't know if I want to go to space. I love the stars. <laughs> I still don't know if I want to go to space. But I love love space movies. Like I and I'm curious, do you have a favorite show or movie that you have just that either maybe inspired it or you're just like this is this is my go-to. This is what I feel like space will be like for me. Avatar. Definitely Avatar. I absolutely love it. I cannot wait for the next movie to come out. And it's just kind of always been, I remember in elementary school, I would go into our library and I kept looking for a book about Pandora as one of Jupiter's moons. And I didn't realize until I actually started like reading that it wasn't Jupiter's moons, it was one of Saturn's moons. But I think that really is kind of just what instilled it. It's just this mesmerizing, adventurous, gorgeous place where it's, uh, it's fascinating. It gives me goosebumps every time I watch it. I have a book that uh, about the science behind it and how they um, like put the dots on the people to do the CGI and yeah. oh, it's just fascinating. Yeah, they're, they're doing heaps of stuff on the sequel at the moment. I understand it should be coming out in the near future, right? Like it's been a long time coming. They've been talking about it for right. years and years and years, and so everyone's sort of hanging on to see when it comes out. I remember it being the 3D, and it was amazing when I went to see it the first time. It just blew my mind. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, it's just that. that Great answer. <laughs> so yeah. just, Thank you. It's just incredible. It's just like a beautiful movie too, right? And I definitely, there was a lot of, oh, we got a question. Um, how has your knowledge from robotics helped with your experimentation? This is from Elias on Facebook. Thanks, Elias. So um, it's definitely taught me a lot about troubleshooting, having things not work and then be like, okay, there's a thousand different things that could be going wrong. What is it? And just going through that process of pinpointing it and picking it apart has Robotics has definitely helps with that because it's like Murphy's Law. <laughs> Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. The robot will be working the night before the competition. You'll show up and all of a sudden it's not. And honestly, just being able to embrace that and knowing that it's all going to be okay. I can tell you for sure that my test apparatus was not done until two days before flight. And I was already in Florida. And that was after the flight had been delayed due to weather and to, um, <laughs> due to um, the FAA um, no longer approving our what's the word airspace stuff. So it was definitely a panic moment, but I've learned a lot about time management and planning. And even though I was ready, just crazy things happen and transporting my experiment in the car, just like with a robot, things jiggle and jostle and don't like being driven around. So yeah. Oh my gosh, Eleanor, just talking about the flight and like getting there in two days before my heart rate just went up. <laughs> But you're right, right. Like just being prepared and being like not just prepared to do an experiment and for success, but being prepared for like what and that that's I can only imagine what it means to like be able to go to space, right? Like you have to be prepared for all of the different outcomes and how do you like resolve those? And we're getting some really like we're getting questions from folks. Um, question um, from Yasin on YouTube. First of all, Eleanor, you rock. <laughs> and they're saying like, where do we find these awesome folks? Um, but what's next for you? I think it's, yeah, it's a great question. What What's what's happening? What's next for you um, in the next like six months, year? Some very exciting things. I'm actually under contract with Blue Origin to go up on a suborbital flight. Well, not me, but my experiment up on a suborbital flight. I would love to go. I'm not sadly allowed. Um, <laughs> but it's going to go up to the Carmen line. And I'm really excited excited because this is going to extend my period of microgravity from about 15 to 30 seconds to like two minutes, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but it means a lot, especially for um, my experimentation, because the results that I got from my um, proof of concept were very, very promising. And I have a bunch of people interested in wanting to learn more. So ultimately, I plan to take my technique to market and be able to um, give it to the space industry as something that they can actively use and help out with. So um, this Blue Origin flight is going to be an amazing next step. I'm also working on something called computational fluid dynamics models, which are um, short for CF CFD is the shortened name. And they're basically computer models that are able to model slosh and things like that. So I'll further be able to experiment that way. And basically just using all of these things to go forward and eventually experiment on the ISS. 
so cool. wow. I, I just oh, i was just gonna say i just love like i'm just learning so much about slosh <laughs> it wasn't yeah, even yeah. something i realized was like an important like piece right um i i think what I probably have like time for like one more question, Eleanor. What advice would you give a young person, right? Like you, like a young person who has such like maybe they have a big dream like you, or they're trying to figure out like just someone who's interested in STEM in space. What advice would you give them to follow their dreams? Because I'm just so blown away and impressed. Like for you to like you want to be on Mars. That's an incredible dream to have, and you're doing it. You're making that happen. What advice do you have for a young person who wants to make their dreams happen? I say go out and go get it. Don't be afraid because honestly, sometimes the world is scary. You can get the answer no a lot. And don't be afraid of the answer no because there's always a way around it. Um, I got told a lot, no a lot of times when trying to work on this experiment. And it honestly just made me realize and understand um, different people's perspectives. You shouldn't be afraid of failure because you honestly learn from failure more often than you learn from success. At least that's how I feel um, because it forces you to think in ways that you never thought of before. And honestly, if you have a passion for something, chase that passion. Uh, Honest, I would not have gotten as far as I am now if I didn't truly love and enjoy what I was doing. So even just truly anything, follow what you love and it's going to take you to amazing places. Oh, I got chills. I feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> I need to hear that today, Eleanor. <laughs> oh. Thank you so much for joining us, Eleanor. It was really incredible to talk to you today and just hear about like your goals and the work that you've done. It's truly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. It's been a blast. Totally yeah. yeah, yeah. Keep doing amazing yeah. science, right? And like, stay in touch. If there's anything we can do to help you out with your science stuff, like, let, let us know. Yes, for we're sure. big fans. Big fans. <laughs> All right. And Thanks for telling me. For my <laughs> suborbital flight. So, I'll keep <laughs> yeah, cool. stay in touch. And after that, I want to hear about your suborbital flight. Like, that's going to be really cool to hear about. I'd love to hear how it changes your experimental procedure and stuff as well, because you can get so much more slosh going on, right? You have two minutes' time. Oh, for like, sure. I'm also going to increase the size of my tank, so that'll be helpful too. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, yeah. we're gonna we'll bring you back, Eleanor. We'll definitely bring you back. We're gonna have to Christina to say that, like, you know how you do that bottle flipping thing? How kids do bottle yeah. flipping? Mm -hmm. That's slot, right? That's you're right. working against yep. slot to make that work. So you do see it in everyday life. You probably come across it. It's not oh, amazing sure. times, but fluid dynamics is just so random. It's really cool. But awesome. uh, yeah, thanks for coming along. It was great to chat science with you, and we'll have you back soon. I hope, Eleanor. Bye, Thank Eleanor. you for having me. Have a good day, guys. Catch you later. Oh, wow Amazing. Just, wow like that was that was really really incredible and so i'm just blown away yeah super yeah, inspiring yeah, yeah. like just to have eleanor to hear about her goals and i'm still just like the concept of someone having a goal to be the first person on mars is in itself inspiring right because it just for me has not something i've ever thought about so that was that was incredible thank you so much to eleanor absolutely yeah yeah that's it the, like, the whole thing the goal is just so like I, like you say i never would have thought of it for myself but like that just that other people are doing it inspires me right that other people have got that in them and thanks for you guys for getting in touch and having a chat with eleanor it's really great to hear from gabal and ali all you guys yes and who we sent the question in from great to hear from you that was awesome everybody um and so that's all we have time for this week christina yeah, but you can always get in touch with us. Or if you have a question, send us a question. Maybe we can answer it on the stream. Send us an email right here, dmah at raspberrypi.org. We'd love to hear from you. And if you're a young digital maker interested in joining the stream, we'd love to have you on. I know like Yasin asked, like, where do we get these incredible folks? It's from you all, right? Yeah. So definitely email us. Let us know if you're interested. Absolutely. And don't forget, make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you can go to rpf.io slash sub if you're not on YouTube already. Or if you are, you can just hit the button because it's literally right there. If you just click it, you'll get all those updates when we're bringing out new content, new stuff for AstroPi, Digital Making at Home, all those cool things that we're doing. So thank you all for being here this week again for the Digital Making at Home live stream. Uh, we're back again next week at the same time. But this time we've got Damien and Richard from Brown Bag Films who are going to talk about doing digital animation and how they work in the film industry. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next week. Catch you later, Christina. Bye. See you later.